and they do it in a way which is nearly unassailable. Therefore, thank you so much. I thank this eminent panel, especially uh, Ambassador Sibyl and Shashi Shekhar for having taken time out and to Professor Babones, despite being uh, exhausted and stretched, agreeing to come here. And obviously, we all recognize, notice and applaud your saffron tie as well. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Professor Babones is an associate professor at the University of Sydney and the author of the recent study of India's democracy rankings, India, Indian democracy at 75, who are barbarians at the gate. I'm sure many of you have read the paper. He earned his MS Mathematical Sciences and PhD Sociology from John Hopkins University, which gives him best credentials in that sense. He's a credentialed intellectual, to use his own expression. His 2018 book, The New Author Authoritarianism, Trump, Populism and Tyranny of Experts, was named among the best on politics by the Wall Street Journal. And his next book that he's focusing on about to write is on the working of Indian democracy. And we look forward to that. Very briefly, before I give it over to Shashi Shekhar. Despite a vibrant press, a tenaciously independent judiciary, and 75 years of free and fair elections, India has somehow gained an international reputation as an authoritarian state bordering on fascism. The Economist Intelligence Unit considers India a flawed democracy. I'm reminded of how active Vijayji used to be on Twitter, I mean, uh, till the other day, encountering these, especially the Economist journalists. Uh, Sweden's Varieties of Democracy Institute calls India an electoral autocracy. And the Washington think tank Freedom House rates India as only partially free. Major news organizations uncritically report such allegations which have now become central to the global understanding of India. This is the crux. And this is being challenged by Professor Babonis. Uh, very interestingly, and to be very brief, we discussed this last time in our first uh, meeting, Chatham House Bennett Coleman Institute of Public Policy, Cambridge, IDEA, Stockholm. All these institutes speak about a recession of democracy in Europe, in the West. There's no discussion on that. There should have been much more discussion on the actual democratic challenges that the Europe, that Europe and the West is facing. And I was, uh, he, and Professor Babones has a very interesting perspective on that. And and therefore, I think we come at a very interesting time. His paper also comes at a very interesting time. And I look at him in the line of uh, scholars like David Frawley uh, in the past who took up the issue of India's cultural representation as well. I'll leave you at the end with uh, a few uh, lines from Professor Barones. I think uh, these are uh, going to continue to remain quite popular. India's intellectual class in its public pers persona is anti-India. In their hearts, I'm sure they're very proud patriots. This is in quotes. But when they go out in the public arena, they talk about India. They are certainly not highlighting India's accomplishments. More importantly, when they criticize India as well as they should, they are as a class not doing so fairly and objectively. Instead, I see tons of evidences of intellectuals selectively attempting to present the worst possible picture of India in their international commentary. That is a problem for all Indians, even for Indians intellectuals, India's intellectuals. Intellectuals, the Western world who does not follow Indian politics closely, believe that India is a fascist country. And that's the problem. India is not a fascist nation, but the Indian intellectuals are making the world believe that it is. Indian politics is not closely followed by the Western world. Why would not the world believe it? And at the end, about Prime Minister Modi, he says, the leader is superior enough to bring the left liberals to a new fever pitch of anger over the loss of their place in society. I mean, this is music to my ears. Actually. Yeah. He also, he also, and he said that, uh, you know, he was accused of being a bhakt. I'm very happy to be a bhakt of the world's most extraordinarily successful democracy. I think that last word defines 
uh, what he stands for. And thank you so much. I would request uh, Shashi Shekhar, Shashi, to please come and give your special remarks. Thank you. <coughs> Good evening, uh, Dr. Ayurban Bambuli, Professor Sagittari Babones, and Ambassador Sibyl, and uh, all of you here this evening. Uh, very happy and honored to uh, speak at this event today. <coughs> Thanks to the Chama Prasad Mukherjee Research Foundation and uh, Dr. Anirban for hosting today's event. And more importantly, keeping this debate going on how the world perceives and judges Indian democracy. <clears throat> I'm sure uh, Ambassador Sibyl with his long stint in diplomacy will have a lot of wisdom to share. And I certainly don't want to steal the thunder from uh, Professor Salvatore, who has taken Lucien's Delhi by storm in the last few days. <laughs> from Kartavya Path to Khan Market, he's seen it all now. And I'm sure he'll have some piercing insights to share. Uh, from all his observations. So I will limit my remarks to a few important uh, issues that I thought I should uh, highlight. Uh, firstly, I want to share an anecdote on how uh, I came to discover uh, uh, Dr. Babunes. Some of you would recall uh, a few weeks back, there was a column in the New York Times uh, which talked about the death of Indian democracy. Now, the irony of that column was that very week when that author had uh, written or got that column published in the New York Times, that author was here, uh, perhaps a couple of streets from this location, hosting a book event to talk about death of democracy in India. <laughs> so, so he had a very free and uh, unfettered uh, book tour in India to sell that book on how democracy was dying in India. So that was kind of paradoxical and ironical. So interestingly, I wrote a counter to that column uh, on how the global media has tended to distort and misreport on India and how, uh, more importantly, in recent years, several instances have, come, have surfaced where geopolitically sponsored narratives have been placed either in social media or in mainstream media. And in this case, I mean, this gentleman, as you will uh, Salvatore was mentioning the other day, uh, happens to have some very strong leanings or linkages with uh, one of our neighbors, China, for example. Uh, the gentleman lives in Hong Kong. He's co-authored a book uh, with another Australian professor, interestingly, uh, on, on the death of uh, democracy in India and so on. Uh, so, so, so these narratives that we are seeing uh, have, you know, you can't take them at face value. There's a lot more going on behind the scenes there. And with the kind of hostile neighbors that we have, I think there are a lot of state-sponsored uh, campaigns as well that are leading to these uh, narratives. <clears throat> so I was pleasantly surprised when I wrote my counter column uh, to receive a message on LinkedIn uh, from Salvatore drawing attention to his work, uh, which then I shared on Twitter and of course the rest is history and we are here in India. So. <laughs> So I think, first of all, I would thank you for your very thought-provoking intervention because I think that has got us all, all of us thinking uh, about these things. Uh, what your intervention highlights, uh, and this is what I wanted to uh, underscore as well, the importance of solid research, a scholarly approach, and to counter these narratives. So there is no substitute for you know sound logic, irrefutable facts. Uh, and then this is one side of the equation. The other side is, of course, to institutionalize alternative ways of looking at uh, these indices, these models. And I think that is where the role of think tanks, research bodies comes in. Uh, and one area where perhaps we in India have not invested enough in, in this kind of research in developing a wider body of knowledge and scholarly works so that they become the authoritative reference. Otherwise, uh, these anti-India narratives that we are seeing, they end up becoming the, the uh, reference point. Uh, for someone who is who's not very familiar with India and, and you know tends to take these at face value. Uh, one example that I often give is uh, you know a creating an online repository, something like the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, for example. Uh, you know, a very sound, very logical, 
uh, very in depth and, and with a lot of scholarly effort going into it, build such a repository about India, Indian democracy, and all, all these aspects about how <coughs> the India, uh, the new India is transforming, how India is developing. So there are so many misconceptions. And I, just to give you one example, uh, just yesterday, I happened to read this uh, English translation of an essay by a Chinese scholar. And, and the subject of this essay was, uh, will Mexico, Vietnam or India uh, replace China as a manufacturing supply chain hub? Now the author talks of various issues that he sees with India, how India has changed in the last eight years under the leadership of Prime Minister Modi, how the economy is transforming and so on. Uh, but again, the, the author also tends to repeat some of the stereotypes, the misinformed stereotypes of India. For a long time, you know, the world has the stereotypical perception of India being, you know, these images of a snake charmer, of god men. And you see in this Chinese essay, uh, that same, you know, uh, misinformed stereotype of, uh, you know, India being uh, of a certain orientation culturally, socially and religiously, and which is why India can't compete with China. Right. So, so these are the kinds of stereotypes that we will have to uh, counter uh, with, you know, with this kind of uh, scholarly work, uh, uh, with a lot of research, <clears throat> and bringing together you know, an ecosystem of scholars, both in India and outside India. I think there's a great initiative that way. Uh, because no amount of tweets, blogs, or columns will, will you know, correct these perceptions. Uh, we have to put in that hard work of research building out these think tanks and this institutional network uh, and then create a whole knowledge base around it. Uh, so I would like to once again compliment uh, Dr. Salvatore for his timely and thought-provoking uh, intervention. Uh, I must also say it's a very courageous uh, intervention because as we can see, uh, there's a very well-organized lobby of activists and intellectuals uh, who have invested heavily in these anti-Indian writers and you will soon be in the crosshairs, in their crosshairs uh, for your uh, for the stance that you've taken, let me just close by drawing attention to one more recent column. Uh, this one appeared in the Foreign Policy magazine, <coughs> written by uh, Ramachandra Guha, where he once again fed us the same narrative of democracy in India being under peril, and he calls he he uh, uses the term the cult of Modi. Well, if there is a cult of Modi, I think it is because there is a guild of Guha. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if this guild of Guha were, you know, intellectually honest in their writings, there would be no need for these kinds of interventions. There would probably be no need for this event. It is the intellectual dishonesty of the guild of Guha for the past two decades that has manifested in these false narratives of uh, democracy in India. So on this note, I welcome Dr. Salvatore to Delhi and India. and look forward to more interventions from him. And thank you again to the foundation and uh, Dr. Anirban for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Shashi. I think, uh, as always, uh, you've made you also given a uh, action a kind of an action plan which we can very systematically try and work at. Uh, thank you so much also for connecting us with Professor Barbones. Uh, the floor is yours, Professor. We look forward to listening to you. Thank you. Guru Gaguji. <laughs> and thank you everyone for coming. If you'll indulge me a moment. I do have some reading to do, and I'm an old man now. Come on, phone. I, I'm genuinely humbled to speak at the SP Mukherjee. Research Foundation, named for someone who ensured a democratic future for 10 crores of Indians. For those of you who don't know the term, that's 100 million people. And thinking of SP Mukherjee, I really have to make very clear, this Mukherjee was someone who was defending Indian democracy, defended it with his life. I'm not here to defend Indian democracy. That's your job as Indians. I'm here to expose the international critics of Indian democracy, 
for what they are. For what they are is liars. I know that's a big statement. Let me start at the beginning. First, it's often said that India is the world's largest democracy. That's an irrelevant accolade. Democracy is unrelated to country size. There are small democracies, big democracies. Size of country has no bearing on democratic institutions. The striking thing about India is that India is by far the world's poorest democracy. Now, I don't use poor as an insult. I use it as a descriptor. GDP per capita, median income, use whatever measure you want. India is by far the world's poorest democracy. If you want to find another country that has not 75 years, even three decades of consistent free and fair elections with peaceful transfer of power, with a functioning judiciary, with an executive that respects the decisions of the judiciary, even when they disagree with those decisions. If you want to find this kind of country, you have to look to countries that are at least GDP per capita, $10,000 per person per year. Five times as rich as India. But even then, you're looking at countries in Eastern Europe, primarily, which are democracies because they had to be democracies to gain entry into the European Union. Their democracies are very strongly institutionally buttressed by European Union membership. If we look for countries that organically developed a democracy on their own, without being forced to, well, then you start looking at the South Koreas and Taiwans, which again have only been democracies for 30 years, not 75 years. In other words, you have to look to countries that are 10 to 15 times as rich as India to find a single country, a single one that is a democracy of the sort that meets the basic criteria of a liberal democratic system. India is also the only post-colonial country, again, categorically, maybe some small island states, we can leave microstates aside. Otherwise, categorically, the only post-colonial country to have remained a democracy throughout its entire post-colonial history. You might say Israel, Israel is not really a post-colonial country. Israel is a settler colonial country. We can debate that, but clearly Israel is a special case. It's not an ordinary decolonized society. The only post-colonial country to have remained a democracy throughout its history. India geographically is also the only country on the Eurasian landmass between South Korea on one end and Israel on the other that is a well-institutionalized democracy. I don't know if international pressures and geography and the difficulty of being in a tough neighborhood affect a democracy, but if it does, India is in a very tough neighborhood and yet has remained a democracy. I'm a statistician. I'm, I'm not an India expert. I'm a social statistician. From a statistical perspective, if we were to model democracy, we would control for things like GDP per capita. We would control for post-colonial history. We would control for geography. If we introduce those kinds of statistical controls, India becomes an extreme outlier in the democracy sweepstakes. India is the world's and Dr. Gangali, you already quoted this from a previous statement. India is the world's most extraordinarily successful democracy. Maybe not the world's most successful. We can debate that. We can try to compare you know, the United States or New Zealand. Everyone loves Jacinda Ardern these days and compare it with India. Okay, fine. But New Zealand is not extraordinarily successful. 
New Zealand is just ordinarily successful for a country of its heritage and its income level. India is the most, if by far, the most extraordinarily successful democracy in the world. Yet, the Economist says that India is a flawed democracy, worse than South Africa. South Africa has serious problems. India is worse. Ryan's Democracy Institute ranks India, and I'm not kidding, on a par with Myanmar. Not pre-coup Myanmar, post-coup Myanmar. They put post-coup Myanmar two places below India, but only you know, one point on their scale below India. In other words, a country run by a military junta is roughly on a par in their view of what a democracy should be with India. Of course, Freedom House Race India is only partially free. Kashmir is absolutely unfree. <coughs> now, you've all heard about the democracy paper I wrote on the democracy rankings. I'm not going to go through it in detail again. It's on the website. You can read it. I'll, I'll just quote my favorite quote from it. Uh, the mendacity of the rankings, the, the most obvious one that anyone can understand, all of the rankings, not all of them, most of them cite the figure that more journalists are killed in India than in any other country outside China. Of course, there are more people with black hair in India than in any country outside China. There are more toilets in India than in any country outside China. There's more of everything in India than in any country outside China. You have to adjust for population size. In India, the journalist death rate, we all want that to be zero. In India, 3.5 per billion people. Five journalists, 3.5 per billion. Rest of world, 6.3 per billion. Despite the fact that India is a relatively poor country, where we would expect journalists to be unsafe because it's a relatively poor country and there are all sorts of dangers in a relatively poor country, journalists are safer in India than in the rest of the world, far safer. Yet the Reporters Sans Frontiers World Press Freedom Index rates India below Hong Kong. That's not below pre-security law Hong Kong. That's below 2022 Hong Kong. All right. If these facts were genuine, Maybe everyone has a right to an opinion. That's fine. They can do things differently. As long as they're talking from the facts, they can interpret them the way they like. It's a free world. People can have their opinions. But there is a responsibility to protect errors. Now, in the paper I wrote, I pointed out lots of errors. I'm very skeptical that those errors will be corrected in next year's ranking. I can't prejudge. It might happen, but I will be very surprised if it happens. But more importantly than the more important than the responsibility to correct errors is the responsibility to tell the truth in the first place. Fair errors I can forgive. Intentional misrepresentations I find much more troubling. I'll give you an example, not from the democracy rankings. I'll make it personal. I don't usually try to bring myself into my lectures. I've become, however, a topic of conversation. So let me view myself objectively as a topic of conversation. On Monday, the print ran a story on my foreign agent registration in the US. The journalist contacted me. We had a nice conversation. I joked with her a little bit. I told her, not only am I registered in the US, I'm also registered in Australia. Here's the website. I even looked up, neither website tells the amount of the contract. I looked up my tax records. I gave her the exact amount, $4,000. I gave her that as a percentage of my income, which is about 2% of my annual income for one year. She duly reported on it. She wrote a factual article. The next day, Shekhar Gupta invited me to come to the print for a conversation. I was thrilled. Uh, I went in, we had a long chat. 
I joked with him about his clickbait. You know, they ran a title for an agent, Salvatore Bonus. But the article was entirely factual. There was no misrepresentation in the article. They put foreign agent in quotation marks. A publisher has to make money. Clicks are how you make money. I'm an India Today box, so uh, they um, they had to make money off me. Somehow they made it off this form. And kudos to them. They're real journalists who do the legwork, who do the hard work to find out these sort of facts. Great work. Unfair headline. I joked with uh, uh, Mr. Gupta's ed editorial director. I said, you know, with all the president's men, the movie about the Watergate scandal, we all love Ben Bradley, the editor, who when Bob Woodward and, and uh, Woodward and Bernstein go to him, we have this story, and they say, he says, who are your sources? What does it say? And then he says, bury it on the inside pages. And Dustin Hoffman gets up and says, but this is, and just looks at him. Jason Robarts, I love the actor who played Ben Bradley, sits back down, Dustin Hoffman sits back down. And so this story should have been buried on the inside pages. Okay, fine. Perfectly factual, though. It's a new world. This is not 1975, 1974, and uh, you need to get clicks, I understand. And you may have seen me with Mr. Gupta holding his book on the print website. We had a great time with it. The next day, a prominent intellectual critic of India, Rutgers Newark professor Audrey Trushke, she tweeted, a reminder, folks, know your sources, especially when it comes to the BJP and Hindutva. The most recent pro-Hindutva voice me, <laughs> is an individual named Salvatore Bogonis a registered foreign agent representing Indian interests. She did not put foreign agent in scare quotes. And she gives a link to the documents, hashtag Hindutva, hashtag BJP, hashtag India. For the record, I've, uh, not only have I never worked for the BJP, you didn't even pay for my hotel. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I paid for my own flight to get here. But nonetheless, hashtag BJP. Okay. Then she blocked me on Twitter. Now, I've never met the woman. I've never mentioned her in public. I, I mentioned her, uh, I think, in passing once. I couldn't remember her name. I have never tweeted to her. Anyone who's seen my Twitter feed will know that I have never said an unnice thing on Twitter in my entire 10 years on the platform. I'll say that I challenge you, go back to my feed, find something not nice. In fact, I used to have the profile. Before I went to uh, work volunteer with the Center for Independent Studies in Sydney, I used to put in my profile, uh, Salvatore Ravonis, self-proclaimed nicest guy on Twitter. That was my, now it just says, you know, tweets do not represent, tweets are personal opinion. They required me to put a disclaimer. Right. Why did she block me? Was she afraid of me in some way? No, she, she didn't want me to see her tweet. She didn't want me to respond. She didn't want to have a discussion about it. She didn't want to have to face scrutiny. Um, she sniped. What, what is the, the military folks in the room? What are, shoot and scoot. That's the military term, shoot and scoot. Okay. Now, someone like Professor Trushley, is very aware of the U.S. Foreign Agent Registration Act. Indians may be unfamiliar. I don't know if India has an equivalent. I know there's the, the registry for uh, uh, organizations that take foreign money, but of FCRA, but I, I don't know how the FCRA applies to individuals. I'm not a lawyer. I know we have some Supreme Court lawyers in the audience. You tell me later. Individual people have no idea how foreign agent registration works. But Trushki does. She's very aware that foreign agent is simply a term. Well, I'll give you the definition. Individuals engaged in advocacy on behalf of foreign governments, organizations, 
or persons. If a foreigner hires you to do any kind of advocacy work, you're a foreign agent. Sounds bad, foreign agent? She's perfectly aware that foreign agent definition in the United States is what we Americans call a nothing burger. In fact, if you're a real foreign agent, you don't register under FARA. Uh, I, no self-respecting foreign agent would do a, a registration and, and pay taxes on the map in two different countries. I have to pay American and Australian taxes. Uh, okay, now she is not acting as a dispassionate researcher. She's acting as a political prosecutor. She's looking for a charge and seeing if she can make it stick. She knows, she must know, that she is misrepresenting the truth, but she's doing it anyway, presumably because she believes that her cause is more important than the truth. Another prominent critic of India, who's an expert on India, is Christoph Jekyll. You've all heard of Christoph Jekyll. He wrote a couple weeks ago in the Indian Express, that Veer Vinayak Savarkar collaborated with the British by encouraging Hindus to enjoy to join the British army. He's an expert on India. He's very aware that Savarkar encouraged Hindus to join the army so that they could rebel against the British from within the army, so that they could, I know mutiny is a dirty word in India, so they could mutiny from the British perspective or start an independence war from the Indian perspective. He's very aware of that. Everyone knows that. Anyone, I know that. And I'm not an historian. I'm not an India specialist. He certainly knows that. Why did he use that fact? He used it because he could selectively try to build a narrative that he knows is wrong. I mean, Christoph Jaffrelot is either an idiot or he knows he's lying. I've seen his work. It must be the second. He is not a stupid person. He is a liar. But presumably, he believes that his lie is in the greater interest of what he believes is best for India and the world. And so he's willing to lie to promote his point of view. Thomas Blum Hansen, another prominent Western intellectual, uh, Mukesh Mumba, uh, Ambani professor of South Asian studies at Stanford University. The old man is probably rolling over in his grave. Oh, cremated or grave? Oh, if the Ambani's get cremated, then he's not rolling over in his grave. That's an argument for. Fears of Muslims and violent fantasies of revenge run through the Hindu nationalist movement right from the beginning till today. Now, I'm going to guess that most of you, not all of you, I guess most of you are probably Hindu nationalists. Do you harbor violent fantasies of revenge against Muslims? I mean, I have not seen a single work coming out of the Hindutva press engaging in violent fantasies of revenge. Not only that, it wasn't there in Savarkar 100 years ago. Can you find someone on Twitter who's expressed a violent fantasy of revenge? I'm sure you can. You can find a Muslim on Twitter who's expressed a violent fantasy of converting the Hindus. You can find anything on Twitter. But to represent that sentiment, as the overall takeaway, as the overall sentiment of Hindu nationalism, he knows it's wrong. He's lying. He's not mistaken. He's not making an error. He is making a conscious lie. Again, presumably in support of what he believes sincerely would be best for the world. He's willing to 
falsify in order to pursue his own idealistic goals. Now, I'm not an India expert. Trotsky, Drakkarlot, Hansen, they are. They presumably speak multiple Indian languages, at least one or two. They may read Sanskrit. They've spent a lifetime in study of India. I've spent a few years studying India on the side while also being the China director of a think tank and also teaching undergraduate social statistics and also writing columns about Trump. Uh, and on the side, you know, I've been studying up on India. If I know that these are lies, they certainly know that these are lies. They are using their expertise because they know where to cherry pick information. And they are abusing their institutional capital in order to peddle facts that they know to be false in support of their political views. In my India Today speech on Saturday, uh, I also cited Ron Ayub and Arantaki Roy as activists, not as academics, as activists. Uh, activists who publish on India. They have a right to be activists. I, I, don't want to, I, I don't want to criticize them so much. The dharma, if you will, if you'll allow me, the dharma of an activist is to promote a political view. Right or wrong, they're in the trenches of political battle. Well, they're going to maybe push things too far. They maybe misrepresent. I don't, I don't admire them but I don't blame them. That's your battle. If you want to fight for Indian democracy, you fight with these Indian intellectuals who are maybe on the opposite side from you. That's your battle, it's not my battle. The dharma of a professor, of a guru, if you will, is to seek the truth. Even if the truth we find is not the truth we want, And the dharma of an editor, to bring things back to the democracy rankings, is to be skeptical, to sort fact from opinion, the wheat from the chaff. The editors at The Economist, Varieties of Democracy, Freedom House, they're not guilty of lying. They're not against India. They're not trying to destroy India. They are guilty of failing to exercise appropriate editorial oversight of the Indian activists and Western professors who provide the content for their reports. Those who love India, and in this category, bear with me. Uh, I include Trushki, Jaffrelot, Hansen, Ayub, Roy. I, I, I have no reason to think that they don't love India. But they're doing India no favor by using international platforms to fight for their preferred visions of the country, even at the expense of the country they profess to love. If they really believe in their agendas, and if they really believe, if they believe at all in democracy, they should take the time and effort to convince Indians of their point of view not to browbeat Indians into accepting them because they can get international support to push India in a certain direction. They should go out to the people of India with their message, one-on-one, -on -one, shake hands, talk to people, and try to convince people to support their vision of India. I don't have a vision for India. I'm an American. I have a vision for America. It's up to you and to them to debate what the vision of India, should, what, the, what your future for India should be. One challenge is these intellectuals claim to speak. They claim to speak for the poor, the excluded, the voiceless. But in a democracy, no one is voiceless. Everyone has a voice. We, we call that the vote. 
Nobody can speak for the poor and the excluded. Uh, you can speak to the poor and the excluded. You can humbly ask them to listen to your point of view and to support your program for the future. Look, I'm here at the SP Mukherjee Research Foundation. I know that uh, Mukherjee is most associated with his native Bengal. Uh, so I hope you'll forgive me if I quote Winston Churchill. <laughs> I, I, of course, I'm aware of the great famine and Churchill's role in it. I know of Churchill's loathing for Hindus. I, I, I'm aware of all of this. But I'm also very opposed to cancel culture. Uh, the man won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Let's listen to his words, even if you don't embrace the man. I'd like to read you some words. You're very familiar with them. It has been said that democracy is the worst form of government, except all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. That's endlessly quoted. Note the framing. It has been said. He's not saying it. It has been said that democracy is the worst form of government except all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. But there is the broad feeling in our country that the people should rule, continuously rule, and that public opinion expressed by all constitutional means should shape, guide, and control the actions of ministers who are their servants and not their masters. I had to go to Wikiquote and add that but personally. The intellectual class doesn't like that but. Okay. I've never met your Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi. I don't know Hindi or Gujarati or any of the other languages he speaks, so I've never heard any one of his speeches that everyone tell me are so captivating and so magical. Uh, they're lost on me. I've heard him speak in English. He's no Winston Churchill in English. But even critics agree, everyone seems to agree, that he has led a life dedicated to service. He's probably not a big fan of Winston Churchill. But he seems to understand the Churchillian approach to democracy. If Mr. Modi has been successful, the BJP has been successful. It's not because of Hindutva or economic management or vote bank politics or any of these things I hear in the press. It's because Mr. Modi clearly understands that he is not the master of India. He's the servant of India. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have seen you have come to the entire spectrum, to the horizon. You have uh, you have uh, referred to Christoph Schaffer as a liar, which is very bold. I wish you good luck. Uh, because these have been these have been uh, gatekeepers. I didn't say he's a bad person. No, you said he was a liar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not necessarily that uh, if you are a liar, you're a bad person. No lie. Yes, I know. I mean, and then uh, he, 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 he he's an he's an informed leader, perhaps, when it comes to India. But they have been controlling the Indian narrative with a vice like grip for the last so many decades. And I think the points that you have been making in your in your uh, paper across various spectrums uh, for, uh, forums in the last one week is exactly this: that the truth 
has to be spoken, it has to be articulated. And most of those who are interpreting interpreting India today on various platforms know the truth but don't want to come out with it. One. Second, something very important is that usage of external platforms to, to commutate the narrative of India. I think you have left us with a with a, a lot of food for thought which needs to be taken forward, debated, discussed, and there are uh, quite a few in the audience who have been doing this over the years as well. So thank you so much, and you are absolutely right. I think uh, Prime Minister Modi, in his approach, has emphasized on Jan Shakti, which is the people's power, on Jan Bhagidari, people's participation, and looking at himself, not only looking, but acting, working out as if, as the Pradhan Seva, as the first servant of the people. And every fundamental change that he has attempted to bring about, mindset change as well as policies, has been done through the active participation of people. And therefore, I think it's very interesting when you said most extraordinarily successful democracy. We have seen that in the last few years, especially. Thank you so much for always being so uh, thought provoking, inspiring. And lucid and succinct and to the point. Thank you so much, Professor. Now, the first ambassador of Tamil Sikhi to give his presentation. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to say a few words about the subject based on my long experience of 41 plus years in uh, diplomacy. Um, back from the time that I joined the foreign service, uh, I and I'm sure all of our colleagues have been battling the whole the problem of uh, defending India and India's image. When I first went to France in 1968, Louis Malle had produced his uh, series of films on Calcutta, uh, the city of joy, which was uh, which maybe we were right, maybe he loved Calcutta and he thought he was doing the right thing in exposing the misery and poverty of Calcutta. But that became, in a sense, uh, very representative of what India was. And in the French mind, that had left a very deep imprint for many, many years uh, of India. And then, of course, there was this whole issue at that time about uh, India not being able to feed itself, then India was overpopulated, and there was this huge concern about whether India would be able to manage that. And there was all these questions about the resilience of Indian democracy. And then, of course, this obsession with caste. Because uh, Homo hierarchicus, the first book that was written on the caste system was by this Frenchman. And that colored the perception of uh, not only the French, but also the Europeans about the ailments of uh, India, so great admiration for China, great admiration for China. Books were written at that time, quoting Napoleon when uh, China wakes up, the world will tremble, something like that. And uh, in the mind, at least of the French, uh, India should have had the revolution, like the Chinese, but never had the revolution, and therefore it was a system based on inequality and the inability to deal with the poor of India. And there was admiration that China had done that. And the French, as you know, periodically, if you look at history, right from the time of the French Revolution, they have been instigating the revolution in Europe, the great, great love of revolution in the French left. And uh, this was another uh, point of uh, calumny against uh, the Indian political system. Indian society that had never 
generated enough intellectual power to change the system from within through a revolution. Then later, uh, during my career, the, the issue of uh, non-proliferation. Uh, India had these ambitions uh, to become a nuclear weapon state, and India moved in that direction, the entire non-proliferation regime would collapse. And that became a, a source of a great deal of negative uh, publicity against India and the decision makers, but I jumped a little ahead. Before that, the whole issue of non alignment is just concerned with the fact that India should be non aligned. Why should India be non aligned? A poor country which is, uh, deserves a great deal of support and sympathy from other countries itself. Um, why should it be non aligned? They should be with us. Uh, so they never really forgave us for a long, long time. And even now, they haven't 100% forgiven us because now we don't talk about non alignment because non alignment is no longer a force. But when we talk about strategic autonomy, then uh, there's a lot of criticism from Marx, the kind of people that he was referring to. <laughs> but how can India should have the courage uh, uh, to be strategically autonomous? No, we should link ourselves uh, to the West. Then, of course, up the feeling that we were pro Russia. And during the Cold War, uh, this was unacceptable. Then, as I said, came the Northern Ireland movement. But along with this, there were these pro Pakistan sentiments, uh, which exposed us to a lot of criticism about uh, oppressing uh, the Kashmiris, not allowing self determination. Uh, not being democratic in that sense, because the whole idea uh, was to support Pakistan for other geopolitical reasons. Uh, along with that came onslaughts on uh, us on the human rights issue. Uh, when I was in Washington, constantly, constantly I had to uh, defend our country, both on the issue of human rights. Mm -hmm. At that time, of course, Kashmir had exploded. I was in Washington from 1992 to 1996. Uh, and human rights. Human rights watch was hitting at us. Asia watch, sorry, Asia human rights watch a little bit. Lady I forgot her name. Um, she was the source of uh, troublemaking for us on this issue. And she had a lot of support in the State Department. And, uh, and of course, the US press was a state department. Uh, they uh, compelled us uh, to set up a human rights commission. And not only that, they wanted to see the text, what was being drafted, what was being approved. And uh, they wanted changes to be made in that the military should come under civilian authority for, for criminal acts and things like that. It was a very difficult time. And then I remember that after the Soviet Union collapsed, um, since this is being recorded, I won't mention names, but somebody that was <laughs> at the helm of affairs in the State Department uh, told me that, look, you know, now there's no Russia to save you. So we're going to press you very hard. Um, I was mentioning to Salvatore that we met earlier. There was this Barbara Corset of the New York Times, which posted here as correspondent. Uh, and uh, during the period that I was there in Washington, and she wrote a book on India. And I read that book, and I can tell you this that. There was not a single positive word about India in all the 300 pages of that book. And when I met the New York editor, New York Times editors, uh, I told them this, that is it that India is such a vast wasteland and a desert that there is nothing grows, there is no reference to our culture, our civilization, our art, our 
folk, uh, uh, folk music, uh, folk tales, uh, our great temples, uh, all of it, there's so much beauty in it there. But there's absolutely nothing. It's all negative, 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 and focused on poverty and non proliferation, poverty and non proliferation, and lack of social justice, or whatever that is. So this has continued. Even today, I mean, I met the editors of the New York Times, I met the editors of the Washington Post, Washington Post repeatedly, very civil conversations, there's no problem with talking to them. Uh, I think they have ears, therefore, therefore they are listening. But it didn't make any difference in terms of uh, what they really saw. Uh, and when they wrote, it was the same thing, repeating, repeating the same kind of things against uh, India. Now, there's one thing which uh, bothers me about ourselves. See, because of the English language, uh, we have a ready access uh, to what is written in the Anglo-Saxon world. Um, and therefore, in our own mind, we believe that the world is the Western world, uh, and primarily the Anglo-Saxon world. So if something negative is written about us, uh, we believe that the world is criticizing us. But if you really look at the real facts, the whole of Latin America has not, not one least bother about your CEA, about your Sahin Bach, about anything else, and I see and stuff like that. Or Kashi. Uh, Africa is not interested. The Arab world is not interested. Asia is not interested. China is not interested. Uh, for geopolitical reasons, they support Pakistan, but they themselves very vulnerable. Russia is not interested. This is the largest part of the world. This is not the world. So why do we assume that the world is uh, criticizing us? This is our weakness. And therefore, we attach too much importance uh, to what is uh, written in the New York Times, or in Washington Post, or in the Financial Times, or in the Economist, or in the Mall, or in the Independent. Uh, I think we need to change our thinking and our approach to these things. Uh, now, some may say that, look, you know, can't totally ignore this uh, because uh, they tend to color perceptions about India amongst the policy makers, perhaps. Uh, and therefore, we need to react. So there are two, two things in this. One is that we need to react because there's pressure within our system. If you don't react, saying we were tolerating this, why not? You must answer back and this and that. Uh, if you ignore, then somebody will say, look, you know, we're terribly awful in terms of defending ourselves. Our whole system is publicity, rotten, our embassies are not doing their jobs. We should have somebody in the government here, in the information and broadcasting ministry, which is set like this. Journalists were writing all kinds of negative things about us. So we are we are forced to react. But the second thing is we have to make a very fine analysis of how much it covers the actual policies of the government that we are dealing with. And there is a mixed bag. Uh, in, in our joint statements with all these countries, uh, which they could stress criticize us very severely. We are touted constantly as the largest democracy in the world. We share values. Uh, so the discourse is okay. Um, so it's not as if, uh, for geopolitical reasons, or the fact that uh, India is now emerging as the economic power, so they have to make sure that they uh, don't uh, lose opportunities in India. Therefore, they balance their uh, thinking and uh, the way they react, the way they deal with us on the issues of democracy. They let their press or the organization, some of them funded by the State Department, to keep pressure uh, on us. But at the official level, uh, the relationship keeps advancing. If I look at our relationship with the United States, it's today the most elaborate, the most wide-ranging, and the deepest relationship we have in any country. Our trade uh, in goods and services is $162 billion in the United States, and we have a surplus 
We are the biggest investors in our country, the biggest uh, sources of technology to our, our country. Um, look at the way in which uh, our areas of the knowledge economy are so deeply linked uh, with the uh, United States of America. The success that uh, people of Indian origin have achieved in America shows at a certain level that there is huge respect and confidence in the in the talent of uh, Indian. So we have to make a very fine analysis of, about how much we take this in our stride, how much we don't, and how much we should react, and how much we should take all this uh, to our heart. The other few points I wanted to make was that uh, uh, the role of our press, uh, especially the English language press. Um, you know, I have been uh, abroad in various countries, and I've seen that uh, if I, as ambassador, wanted to convey my viewpoint through the columns of Le Monde or Washington Post or the New York Times, I would never get that opportunity. In Egypt, I would, I did, when I was ambassador there, because it is in a way, like India. Uh, but here, uh, every day I see foreign ambassadors are writing long columns, foreign leaders are writing long columns. Um, other day, the Indian Express had a column by the German foreign minister and the German commerce minister together. I tweeted on that. That is Baerbock lady, uh, she, she, she is, her, her position on Kashmir is totally unacceptable. And when she's talking about climate change, these two ministers slam Russia on what has Russia got to do with climate change. I think because of Ukraine, uh, the trust is lacking in the international community on issues of climate change. I don't see the connection. And this is being written when our foreign minister is in Moscow. It's simply not done. I don't understand how our press and our editor don't understand this. That you don't, as a, as a convention, diplomatic convention, allow foreign leaders or foreign ambassadors to criticize a third country in your press with which you have very good relations. It, it, it is a kind of convention that serious countries believe in. But I've been Telling the Indian Express, oh, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> well, since I mentioned the name, but why do you entertain this talking out of uh, That he is telling us about ourselves. Don't we have people, our own people, who tell us about ourselves? Why do we need to have these kind of people? And Indian professors who are in this university or that university, they interpret the latest developments in India, the latest. Uh, policies that the Indian government has pursued, they will analyze that for us. Um, there is uh, this fellow, uh, I've forgotten his name. The, the moment something, uh, some policy is taken, uh, the right name Indian Express or what? Professor in. Uh, no, no, no. Ashutosh Vashni. So I have uh, in my, on my tweet attacked him very but logically. But Ashutosh Vashni. But in the next press, he's publishing his articles constantly. Uh, I don't mind, frankly, if our own people sitting in India uh, write or say what they want. It's part of the freedom of press. And you can't have all our press uh, saying the same thing. It's not in a democracy. But when you give space constantly to professors, Indian professors largely, but not only, who are working in foreign universities, and sometimes very low level or middle level uh, people who, today in the Hindu, sometimes there was there's some middle, middle woman, she was on something, but she's a nobody. But they get so much space in our. Prime uh, English language news. So I think um, we have to be uh, a little uh, conscious of our own uh, 
as I say, weaknesses in this regard. Uh, then there's this new thing about uh, when you want to demolish uh, Indian democracy, uh, then you say, oh, you know, it's majority and this and that. I don't understand because uh, there can't be any democratic functioning unless a party wins majority. Uh, otherwise, you can't form a government in a, in a country. You can, even when you have a coalition government, you have to have a majority. And the uh, party that wins has its manifesto, has its policy um, choices, and then they implement them. So, why should it be called majoritarianism? I mean, party wins a majority, is it then required to implement the agenda of the minority? party is at loss, it, it doesn't make any sense. Now, if you are going to actually pursue policy which actively exclude that segment of the population that did vote for you, then yes, then it is uh, really not a, a, a democracy in true sense. But if all your policies are inclusive, uh, that they are not framed in a way which they actually discriminate against the minority or deny them their rights, then yes, you can talk about misuse of your majority in terms of suppressing the minority. But then you have the other course. And I think this, <laughs> there are not many reasons why many of us might be not terribly happy with the way our course functions. And there can be a reasonable case made that uh, they interfere with the, the executive and this policy, uh, they don't give the, they uh, sometimes take ideological uh, positions and they hamper the efficient functioning of the government. Uh, which is why recently uh, the law minister sounded a little warning that, uh, you know, this, this whole business about whether they selecting themselves is nowhere, nowhere in any democracy you have a situation where the judges upon themselves. And the judges are not at all answerable in terms of uh, the selection process. Anybody else said their own milieu. Uh, but there it is. Uh, now, if you are talking about a democracy, firstly about this largest democracy in the world, uh, I think if you really look at uh, what India is between one fifth and one sixth of humanity, 1.35, 1.4 billion people, uh, <laughs> so we are we have had this historical road of which we should be extremely proud that uh, we have ensured that this one fifth, one sixth of humanity has remained. A democracy has been functioning under a democratic system. So what India has contributed to democracy is incomparable, incomparable. Uh, but this is not uh, recognized. And this in the face of all the challenges that any political system will face. We are so diverse. There's virtually no country, large country of our size, that is as diverse as India is. Multilingual, multicultural, multi religious, multi ethnic, multi whatever, whatever multis there are, we have those multis here. And you can't run this country with such diversity unless in the leadership, in the political system, there's a capacity to accommodate, to accept, to live and let live, to ensure that basic stability is maintained, to deal with challenges that occur in a way that the Instead of a conflagration, the fires are doused. And we've been doing this now for the last uh, 75 years, very successfully. This would be appreciated. We have, unlike many of the great democracies, we, you know, who have uh, eliminated their indigenous populations. In India, on the contrary, our indigenous populations have grown immensely in numbers from 1947 
till today. Even the Muslims who are supposed to be discriminated against uh, have grown from over 30 some million to 200 million today. We have a tribal who's just been appointed president of our country. This is the mindset of our ruling class. Whatever flaws there may be, and, and no system is perfect, that uh, there is a basic humanism in our thinking, in our policies. Uh, and that is a great uh, strength of India, but unfortunately, that is not uh, recognized. Uh, I think uh, I would stop there because I have exceeded my time by five minutes. So, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador uh, Sibyl, for mm -hmm. uh, uh, giving this overview. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, there's this time period which controls the India, India discourse. And I'm good that we are following on today. Uh, I think we take a few questions. Uh, all right. Fine. So we take a few questions. Yes. Person you start with you. Yeah. But questions, please, no statements. And no long drawn statements also. One short questions and one. No supplementaries. <laughs> so my question is about the process of rating. If I were to draw an analogy with the business school uh, rating, now uh, that uh, then done by uh, local agencies, there are a lot of parameters which are used. You know, the number of uh, uh, doctorates, the quality of infrastructure, the students have their salary, how old the institution is, etc. Data is not given. And when data is collected, not all institutes are able to provide the correct data or all the data. So there are omissions. And hence, uh, it's impossible to do an apple to apple comparison, and there are misrepresentations in the overall ranking. So I'm just curious as to whether the same happens when uh, uh, democracy ratings are also done. All three democracy rating systems rely on expert surveys. Uh, so there are surveys of intellectuals and university professors and leading journalists uh, in the country and people who study the country. The lists of the survey respondents are not published, uh, but the rankings are not uh, calibrated across countries, that each country gets a numerical score of its own, and the rankings result from comparing the numerical scores. So, for example, no one directly compares India and Hong Kong and press freedom. India's journalists tell about press freedom in India, Hong Kong's journalists tell about press freedom in Hong Kong, and wherever the numbers line up, uh, they line up.
researching India from afar because I am a social statistician. Uh, I can't visit every country I study. Now, I've specifically focused on India because, as I said in the lecture, it is an extreme outlier from the standpoint of studying democracy. And that's got my interest. And for the last three years, I've been reading the, uh, the independence literature on India, following Indian politics, politics, listening to Indian media. I subscribe. I mean, I, I'm criticized by people like those of you in this room, I would assume, for the fact that the one Indian newspaper I subscribe to is the Indian Express, and every day I listen to six days a week. I listen to Shekhar. I listen to Shekhar Gupta uh, on the print. Uh, you can get a lot of information without falling for the false narratives. And I've been three years living in India from abroad. Yeah, that is super. Even we have every year banking. Whether it's annual index or health or education or other parameter. So don't you think there's a gas for they don't say museum they we, we have our health or a hunger or a food nutrition? Why do you try to rely on Indian system? Well actually when it comes to human indices, uh, India is compared to many other countries that work on that well. And in a sense it's understandable if we were 200 million people, 300 million people, will be probably amongst the top 10 numbers. But when, when you have 1.4 billion people, that to raise them to that kind of a level of human is where the West thinks it's acceptable for you then to be considered a developed country or a reasonably developed country. That's a very, very different task. But we are at it. We are at it. Uh, now the, I think what I want to call them Stanley or somebody. Said that uh, it will become uh, eight, seven, or eight trillion uh, very commonly by 2027. Uh, whether we actually achieve that or not achieve that, but the perception by serious people is that India's economy is going to grow very fast now. If that happens, and I hope it will, then all these indices will go up uh, inevitably because then there will be more available to the government in terms of uh, financing social welfare programs. It's already the government. Is doing. Look at the remarkable things we have done, which actually is not appreciated. Feeding 800 million people for uh, funding procedures. Uh, this is absolutely remarkable. This is more than almost the population, of, uh, not quite, uh, almost the population of Africa, that's the 1 billion to 800 million is not too far away. Look at, the, look at what we have done. But the point still is that we are a relatively poor country, as was rightly said, and our per capita incomes are not high. But the government is very conscious of the fact that they have to do whatever is possible within our resources uh, to make sure that the policies become much more inclusive, especially under the present government. I think uh, the time is on our side, and in the next 10 years, we'll see a very good change.
you know, we are always on the uh, defensive regarding what the Western media has been writing about India. Why is it that we have not been able to build our own narrative? So here, whether it was Prasad Bharti, who is New Darshan and All India Radio, or it is the, the mainstream, you know, privately owned media, we hardly have our reporters and writers, uh, in, you know, not even in the capitals now, the Western capitals. So why is it that we have to constantly defend ourselves instead of building our narrative and the way we look at the other countries? Absolutely, I agree with what you're saying. I think we have not invested in these institutions enough. Right? If you look at most of the other countries, they have strong global news brands. We had Al Jazeera, we had Russia today, CGT and so on. Uh, we have not made that investment and we have been lagging behind on that. I think that's perhaps uh, very urgently required. Next year we are hosting the G20. Uh, the world is going to come to India. It's a great opportunity. India needs to have a global, a strong global voice and it's long overdue. Okay, uh, Professor, my question is, uh, when you talk about the you know, Western narrative about India, which is very negative in the last one year or so, compared to the narrative about China, which is perhaps not so, so negative, perhaps uh, there's a presumption that China also controls the narrative that comes from the West. So is there an apprehension in the West that if they do not try to pin down India in some of the other way, maybe in the next one decade, India might go out of control like China. So they want India to remain somewhere between a failed state like Pakistan and a completely assertive resilient state like China. They just want India to remain a market and nothing more. No, I, I don't think there's any desire to keep India down. Uh, there's profound ignorance about India. Uh, all of you probably heard of Ron DeSantis' victory in the Florida election. Who's heard of uh, Yogi Adityanath, the most famous chief minister in India? I, you know, who, I doubt many people outside India really know anybody in India except Narendra Modi. And even him, I've heard prominent Australians and Americans call him the president. Of India. They have that, that low level of knowledge about India. In a low information environment, a few shrill voices carry a long way. Uh, if people outside India had as deep a knowledge of India as you do in the United States, then you would not have this problem. I mean, after all, my own president, Joe Biden, was on television a couple of days ago telling us democracy is the ballot. If you vote Republican, that's the end of American democracy. <laughs> none of you take it serious. I hope none of you take it seriously. Americans don't take it seriously. But, but if Americans heard the same thing from uh, Rahul Gandhi, like they would be, they they might, because they don't have that knowledge. If they hear from the Economist Intelligence Committee, we ignore the New York Times writing about America. But we take it seriously, right? So it's that low information environment. Now, China in particular, China's uh, burnished image is entirely due to China's money. Uh, people make a lot of money in China. Wall Street makes a lot of money. Hollywood used to make a lot of money. Silicon Valley used to make a lot of money. And they're all desperate to get back to making money in China. And they lobby heavily uh, for a pro-China view. And I've seen that in Australia with mining companies in Australia, lobbying heavily for pro-China. Please don't anger China with a lot of money there. Uh, my question to a professor. So, propaganda is a new weapon. It is applied across the globe. So, the strategy is that propaganda is the past and weaponize the propaganda. And the same thing happened with you. You said something which was against the, uh, you know, so-called intellectuals. And they wrote an article. The content was different. The heading was different. The heading was that you were a foreign foreign agent, agent, quote unquote. And people they left the country and they carried away the heading. So this is this is exactly the case. Propaganda is the past and weaponize the propaganda. This 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 strategy was applied on you all. Uh, honestly, so I, my question oh, is sorry. that is there a motive? Because the people doing that, they are not fools, they are not idiots, they are intellectuals. Yeah, really, really. So what is the motive? What do you feel is the motive? So first, I want to be clear. In 
my view, I was not propagandized, I was monetized. <laughs> and, and that's just the fact of being in the intellectual world, that if you want to be heard and have a voice in this media space, you have to have a thick skin and be willing to accept it as a price of admission. I'm, I'm fine with it. I, I have no real complaint. I mean, I'm modest. No real complaint. I don't think that there's any kind of organized propaganda effort against me personally. I don't know, maybe it'll happen. But I think it's really just a small number of shrill people who are upset at being called out. I think most journalists, uh, most publishers, most uh, are, well, uh, are most politicians for that matter are well-meaning people who want to do what they think is right. But uh, you know, we don't always agree with each other. And that's fine. Robust debate is at the heart of I don't view it as a problem. I mean, it's the wrong strategy. And if I were writing a newspaper, I, I would want to always be respectful. But I would also understand that my respectful newspaper would probably go bankrupt. <laughs> and so it's inevitable that you know we'll have a more provocative tone. I'm Raghu. I'm from Pondicherry, very far away from Delhi. I see you're a, a Frenchman. You're so fashionable. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, your next thing that you should have to know about. Uh, my question, because you're all somebody who works very closely with the Australian, and you spend with Indian democracy, and you observing it for over three years now, uh, during the past. What has been a departure since uh, the uh, onset of uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi? In present, incredibly establishing what India is in the world stage. If you could perhaps, uh, we discussed quite a lot about how it is misrepresented, but what is it that Prime Minister's <coughs> leadership brings to the table in the, on the forums across the world? Where India has, where you have observed that India very focused. For example, I am I'm somebody from uh, very far from Delhi. So I don't rely so much uh, within the, uh, you know, the press circuit and stuff in, in Delhi, Delhi center. But I see our foreign minister making very, very straightforward statements across. And that's something that, as a lazy citizen, has kind of uh, captured my attention. So, so I'll, I'll prove now that I'm not a BJP box, because Narendra uh, Modi, especially Dr. Jai Shankar, uh, has not been especially effective at countering that image abroad. India's image abroad has improved because Westerners are now making more money. If you want to improve India's image abroad, open up sectors for investment, <laughs> open up opportunities for Western firms to make money in their own strong lobbies for uh, India. Now, Mr. Modi and Dr. Jay Shankar, let's face it, are, are politicians. And Dr. Jay Shankar's muscular defense of India abroad is not directed at Western audiences, it's directed at India. No, I have been uh, inside good travel a little bit here and there, been to the country. Uh, those views uh, uh, we are sensitive to. Uh, I think a lot of damage, a lot of damage has been done by the people that we are speaking about uh, to Prime Minister Modi's uh, comments that he made in, in the Uttar Pradesh. People who are not, people who are cultivated, educated in the West, but are not particularly following the Indian uh, uh, developments, read the, the newspapers, you know, in America, New York Times, the Washington Post, whatever. So this business about fascism and all that has taken root amongst uh, uh, a lot of, uh, of so that's unfortunate. However. Uh, at the leadership level, there is a different perspective. I was quite surprised and very happily so when uh, Putin called uh, Modi an icebreaker. You know, you just cutting through obstacles, you're pursuing your national interests, you're undeterred. 
you won't put one good labor country with patriotic he has a very good personal equation with the French president. <laughs> they talk to each other. A lot of respect. I uh, don't have as far as I can say. You see, you saw the example. This is almost uh, what has changed. Uh, from the time that we had uh, this, uh, this World Bank, um, the uh, India Development Forum, or whatever it is called, where uh, half penny, two penny, three penny countries. Would want explanation from us how they want to use their aid given the twenty million dollars they gave. Uh, now when it goes there, four Nordic countries together, these are prime minister. When he goes to Central Asia, the five Central Asian countries meet him. They are all the ASEAN associate and come and come to our public day two years ago. He has a meeting with all the leaders of the Caribbean together, the island states together. The Mexican president the other day said that uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi and Pope and one other person uh, should do something about the Ukraine conflict. So there's a lot of respect for him at a certain level, but at the popular level or at the middle class level, uh, a lot, of, lot of harm has been done by our own people. I'll come to you. I'll have that. Uh, greetings, sir. Uh, my question is directed at uh, Master City. So, we talked about a lot of banking, most of them were private trade and also not, which were basically covering Indian democracy. But there are at the same time certain actions which are led by the state, other department of state, for example. Uh, regarding freedom of religion also. And there's a lot of speculation that these are rankings very particularly utilized uh, to direct bilateral relations. So for example, when India's relations with Russia kind of crossed and then it took a decision which was not in favor of what the United States and the EU kind of wanted. So, and these kinds of situations, these uh, reports are utilized as a pressure group or uh, something to basically pressurize the Indian government to take a decision or maybe think twice before taking a decision against the US. And similar kind of statistics are also used uh, when they are basically dispersing a lot of funds. As you know, the Department of State gives a lot of funds to different NGOs. And many of those are not quite favorable or uh, basically part of the press that we are talking about, which just maligns the country. So what is your perspective and based on your experience, does it, uh, is it basically being determined entirely at the level of the government? Or there are certain people like, as we talked uh, talk about the Trinity or so, who have reached certain positions in the State Department who are autonomously acting and have does not have direct correlation with new government as well. Uh, well, India uh, has get a very bad press, whether it's the Washington Post, New York Times, Economist, Atlantic, we get a, a lot of press. And as I gather from your uh, talk today, and I heard your India Today conflict too, uh, you attribute this to ignorance or editorial oversight. Uh, is there something deeper to that? Because let's consider that our bed press, whom does it benefit? And one of our adversaries is China. And they have a lot of money flowing into America, there is business. So I was just wondering whether it is more than just ignorance, is it a concerted design of an investment made into universities and other areas to back out the thing? So your question is nothing new. Uh, you know, the State Department, uh, by law, is uh, required to produce reports on uh, human rights, terrorism, and uh, religious freedom. Uh, so they so they have to do their work. So they get keep getting reports from the embassy and that is collated by the State Department, and that is made into a report and introduced to the press. So. Uh, so there is official role in this. That is one. The other is that uh, they use it as a pressure point on India. There is nothing new. I have experienced it myself when I was in Washington. Uh, but they should have learned from experience that uh, they can.
can go this far and walk further uh, in this regard. Uh, but we, we keep at it. The other is that, uh, of course, there's an ecosystem in, in the United States and Great Britain, less so perhaps in France, uh, where uh, there are a lot of uh, inputs that uh, are received from a lot of agencies and think tanks and opinion makers. Uh, and then there are also electoral considerations that come in about what position to take, what to project. And that will serve larger uh, features of these countries. So the work at two levels. At, at direct government, official level, maintain a certain degree of balance. But uh, use other means that will keep India under pressure and opposition, because especially as they are reacting. Uh, now, for example, then, the uh, State Department, the United States, some unknown fellow, told the New York Times and Washington Post that uh, India uh, has been helpful in terms of grain shipments and the nuclear question. And uh, they can uh, perhaps uh, uh, help in terms of uh, dialogue. Now, this is purely bluntly, because if the United States wants a dialogue, they can immediately have a dialogue with Russia. They won't be pleased with that. But just before the midterm elections, there's a lot of pressure. The Defy Commission said that look, we must start talking uh, to uh, democratic communities to Russia, and the Republicans also deciding by policy in Ukraine. So they have clearly yeah, known that we are interested in a dialogue, but Russia is interested. And therefore, we are asking countries like India, please to come and share the talk. It's a complete hogwash. But our press did something. For two days, I found this thing. They are going to pay me 18 euros and this country. So we are made dukes. We allow ourselves to be made dukes of the outside agendas, and then we pick up big money. Everyone knows the ego principle garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> the mainstream is. We're talking about the, the press, the democracy rankings. They accurately reflect the sincere opinion of the Western establishment intellectual class that studies India. They don't represent the opinions of maybe a few of Indians, of Indians who want to be in the States, of Indian professors of management or Indian professors of engineering. They accurately represent the opinions of India experts abroad, of the of the Mukesh Ambani professor at Stanford University. It doesn't get any more prestigious than that. Or an Indian professor abroad, or the professors at Yale, the professors at Harvard, who I've studied since I my papers. They're being accurately reflected. Now, Chinese interests doesn't help. China spends money very badly. They're, they're very bad at the interest game uh, to try to try to darken India's image. Uh, but I don't think they're very effective at it. Um, they're not very influential Western editors who are all skeptical of China. Yes, they don't want China daily to remove their inserts, but that the degree of influence China has is much more spent on preventing bad coverage on China than on promoting bad coverage of in India. The, the institutions that convey Knowledge of India are accurately conveying a flawed picture of India. They are not warping that picture to suit some purpose of their own. Can I just say something on this? Just one small point. When I was in Washington and the Kashmiri Pandit exhibition, that year's report of the State Department's report on terrorism omitted any mention of China. I raised it with the State Department. And uh, they said that uh, they believe that uh, the governor has not been. Uh, but you know, there's still the story that there's a unknown heart concern. I think this is total bad taste. So I, I'm not too sure whether uh, when they write these reports, they write them as objectively as possible from their point of view. There is, there, there is an agenda. It did suit at that moment for them to accept the fact that they were ethnic cleansing taking place. Because there is 
प्रेजेंटेशन के बाद दिखाने आता है ताकि वो जाए बट इफ आई कैन हैव यू कैन ब्लेम द वाशिंगटन पोस्ट फॉर रिपोर्टिंग व्हाट द स्टेट डिपार्टमेंट फाइंस Thank you so much, and I think uh, uh, this brings us to a very interesting uh, finale. I think tomorrow you have a final program. We uh, change good luck. <laughs> uh, we have many JNU veterans also around with us here, and uh, thank you so much. Uh, in your study of Indian democracy, while you'll be researching your book, you'll come across a very interesting figure: a member of parliament. A very uh, vocal member of parliament, elected from Godhra, who could at times go around the parliament lobby with a placard saying, "I'm a foreign agent," because Mrs. Gandhi, at one time, that was a favorite word with her. She would brand any opposition to her as a foreign agent. Perhaps Neeru Modi would make a very interesting uh, <laughs> mention about it. Uh, It's very interesting that you mentioned right at the beginning and at the end, Dr. Shama Prasad Mukherjee. And while he was speaking, I recall that one of the last, the last interview that Dr. Mukherjee gave in his life was to the BBC, and it was about working the Indian democracy. And very unfortunately, after the interview, due to circumstances as events unfolded, he was detained in Kashmir. And he passed away in the morning of 23rd June 1953, and BBC broadcasted that interview on that day. So I think one of the final thoughts that leaders like Dr. Mukherjee had, leaders who contributed, as we discussed the other day, who contributed majorly to to protecting, nurturing, and keeping Indian democracy on an even track. The last thoughts that they had to Was on the working out of Indian democracy. I think we are extremely delighted to have you here, Professor Salvatore. It has been uh, you have regaled the uh, whole of India for the last one week, <laughs> and uh, we have been glued to what you have, you have said uh, because you have uh, breathed in to this entire debate new dimensions, new light. And also new perspectives, as well as a lot of laughter. So thank you so much for this and for taking time out uh, from your extremely busy schedule to come and address this very interesting audience here. I would like to thank, uh, thank uh, Shashi Shekhar because of whom we got in touch. And I have never seen anyone so prompt on DM the way you respond to messages. Uh, I am extremely grateful to Shashi for continuously encouraging us, supporting us in this. Uh, Uh, in this area of uh, of uh, work that we have undertaken, looking at the ratings of India's democracy, looking at the entire narrative of India democracy, democracy in danger in India, and so therefore, Shashi, thank you so much, uh, and I hope uh, you continue, we continue to receive your support, your guidance as well, and last but not the least, Ambassador Kandal Sibal, whom we have read, whom we go back to to better understand. International perspectives and to understand India in the world. Thank you so much for always responding to our invitation, for encouraging us by your presence, and for constantly encouraging us by your presence on Twitter as well, <laughs> and saying what you do without fear of failure. Thank you so much, and thank you everyone who has come here today. Uh, and it's because your presence, the annex is not always a very easy place to get to. <laughs> Uh, but in spite of that, you've all come here, and your presence has made all the difference. I thank all those who have asked questions because that really set us also going. Thank you so much. Till we meet again.